Uh, my name is Anthony Zui. I'm uh, involved in global health at University of New South Wales and was interested in um, comments by both speakers about um, declines in the real economy and the impact both on uh, social services and instability. Um, in a way, you alluded, both alluded to that. And I was wondering whether um, either of you could comment in more detail about um, what is known about these economic downturns and impact on social stability and also delivery of basic services like health and the knock-on effects of that, for example, for not achieving the MDGs? Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, delivery of basic social services, I don't think there is going to be that much of a negative impact because, uh, as, as I alluded to, governments are expanding in response to the crisis rather than contracting. So part of that fiscal expansion will be in those precisely those basic social services that you just uh, alluded to. Now, in terms of the issue of whether this uh, downturn in Asia will lead to greater uh, social unrest and political instability, that is, uh, that is clearly a possibility. But at this point, it's a largely speculative possibility. But encouragingly and appropriately, governments throughout the region, for example, in China in particular, are adopting uh, policies that are designed to address this kind of growing instability. Now, let me give you a very concrete example on this, uh, an example which also holds valuable policy lessons for other countries. Uh, I'm not sure if you know of Guangdong province, but it's the very central manufacturing province, right, surrounding Hong Kong. And the Guangdong provincial authorities have just very recently quadrupled their vocational training program to cover four million workers. Now, this not only helps the laid off workers uh, tied over a difficult period, but it's also good for the uh, economy's long-term competitiveness because it upgrades the skills uh, of the workforce. So it's like killing two birds with one stone. And I think, I don't, I, don't, I, I, I think that's a very good, clear example of how, what governments can do to protect the poor, but in this case, it even has the added benefit of uh, improving or enhancing the uh, economy's long-run competitiveness. And I think uh, it holds very valuable policy lessons for other, uh, for other governments, both regional governments as well as uh, national governments. I think this is, this is a, a key concern, and I, I've got to preface by saying I know there are people in the audience that are better able to answer this question than I, but governments in the Pacific, they tend to find the soft spots when there's a problem. So this means that maintenance gets cut, so that means access to villages. It means edu education gets cut. So the school books won't arrive next year. The medicines won't arrive next year. We know there are soft spots in government budgets. So this is one reason why we're extremely keen to try to get in early and try to find some way where we can get some leverage and protect this social expenditure. Right now, with the, the budgets coming through, they're going to have less revenue. So we need to act quickly on this. In terms of the, the social unrest, I think the, the, the great news for the region in, is that Timor-Leste has adopted a more expansionary fiscal policy. So that, that was always going to be the key risk, that even though they had this wealth, they weren't sharing it, and that was going to lay the seeds for this unrest. They seem to have acted on that. So that's fantastic news. Solomon's is, a, is an issue, and I, I'm not going to try to comment on, on uh, other than to say it's obviously a high-risk area. Uh, Carolyn Marsh, independent consultant. Um, I'd like to ask people, um, what do you think the probable impacts would be on Australia from the crisis in terms of the Asian and Pacific regions, and what consequent actions Australia might take in view of those probable impacts? I think the key uh, word here is China, right, as far as Australia is concerned, because China is a major, major market for Australian commodity exports. And as we just saw during my presentation, China will decelerate. Its uh, growth will come down significantly, and that is going to have an impact on Australian exports and th therefore on the Australian economy. But to be more, a, a little bit more precise than that, China's exports are falling 
substantially. They are collapsing, and that poses a big, uh, a big threat or risk to Australian commodity exports, because a lot of Australian commodity or raw material exports to China become intermediate goods or in inputs into China's uh, manufacturing uh, manufacturing processes, and that and which are exported to the outside world. So, China the the uh, slowdown of Chinese growth in general will adversely impact Australian exports, but in particular, the sharp slowdown of China's exports will have an especially pronounced impact on Australian commodity exports and therefore on the Australian uh, real economy. Uh, and of course, the re response for Australian government would be the similar, analytically the same as the response by any other government that is counter-cyclical policy, counter-cyclical monetary policy, counter-cyclical fiscal policy. I, I, I don't follow Australian economy that much, to be honest, but uh, th this is what is required in order for Australia to revive its demand in, in response to this weakening exports and weakening external demand. Okay. Uh, John Langdale, Macquarie Uni. Um, I'm interested in the impact of uh, the crisis on um, remittance flows, both for the Pacific region and for a country like the Philippines. You know, the downturn in oil prices is meaning that um, a lot of the Filipinos working in the Persian Gulf would probably be sent home. But I'm also interested in the Pacific region because the remittance flows from Australia and New Zealand are quite significant. What impact do you think on the GDP is, going to, is likely in 2009, 2010 for both the Pacific region and for um, a country like the Philippines? Okay, as a matter of fact, ADB has carried out some uh, very recent studies about Filipino work, overseas workers' remittances back to uh, the Philippines and what's been happening to those remittances since the crisis. And somewhat unexpectedly and somewhat surprisingly, they have been holding up very well so far. And, and some of the reasons are that many, of, many Filipino workers overseas have some, some types of skills that are not completely unskilled workers. And the, the ones that are laid off the fir first are, tend to be the, the most unskilled workers, semi-skilled workers, those with, without specific skills that the host economy needs. So in that sense, Filipinos' workers are protected. That's one possible reason. But I think the more important point here is that whatever the reason, and we are still trying to uh, uh, figure the reasons out, the remittances, at least for Filipino overseas workers, have held up quite well so far. There's a number of ways it can work. One possibility is that a lot of the workers in the Pacific overseas are sort of uh, on the fringe of the labour market. So they're the first to suffer, and that because they haven't got savings, the remittances will drop off quickly. Now, another view is that, in fact, in, say, New Zealand, the unemployment benefit is pretty high anyway, and it's not that different. So that, that it doesn't matter. Right? Um, and another issue is that there's going to be so much uh, shocks in the, in the economy that everyone will actually have to find some way of dipping into their wealth, whether they sell a car, whether they take loans, and in some way, remittances keep going. So we don't know. But it is significant that the remittances to Fiji over three years have dropped from 5.1% of GDP to I think it's 3.2% of GDP. In last year in Samoa and Tonga, Remittances from the US declined in US dollar terms. It was offset by improvements in Australia and New Zealand, but you know, there is a noticeable effect. So we unfortunately have to wait and see, but it's certainly the initial numbers are worrying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in the context of the Filipino overseas workers' remittances, one poss additional possible reason why, contrary to expectations, they have been holding up reason reasonably well is this. A large share of the remittances come from older, more well-established migrants, such as Filipino doctors and nurses in the U.S., rather than the more, more recent uh, migrants. That's a, that could be another key reason why remittances have been holding up quite well. Uh, Dennis O'Neill, uh, New Power Resources, a question of Dr. Park. Uh, in identifying a remedy in, in the Asian context as a, a shift from uh, external demand to internal demand. Uh, would you care to offer us uh, a predictive sketch as to what shape that internal demand might take and over what time frame? Would it, for example, be led by 
uh, increased investment in infrastructure followed by perhaps uh, increased uh, demand for consumer goods or, or such other mix as you may care to explain to us? Okay, uh, I was going to expand on these points, but unfortunately uh, um, uh, my time ran out, so now you're giving me an opportunity, uh, so thank, many thanks for that. Um, what we find through uh, econometric analysis, in other words, rigorous empirical analysis, which is part of the ADO, is that the uh, bigger problem in Asia is oversaving rather than underinvestment. In plain, simple, plain English, Asians are saving too much, uh, saving too much, consuming too little. So the focus of the policy has to be on encouraging consumption. Some specific policy options, are, these are pretty well-known standard ones, are for governments to invest more in health, education, and pensions, and areas like these. So individual house, individuals and households have less have weaker incentives to engage in precautionary saving, so that will encourage them to spend more. At the same time, I must emphasize, it's rebalancing growth in Asia is not simply a matter of boosting demand. It's also a matter of altering the output structure and demand structure, so they become more closely aligned with each other. Well, for, I mean, let me give you a concrete example. An uh, export promotion zone or special economic zone that produces goods, uh, high-end goods, expensive goods that are geared exclusively toward foreign markets, if that foreign demand evaporates or collapses, as is happening now, there's very little scope for rebalancing. But, but encouragingly, what is happening throughout Asia, in particular the giants of China and India, is that we, we are seeing this new, large, emerging middle class, people who are buying their first cars, first personal computers, first refrigerators, and so forth, and that suggests that rebalancing is not only desirable, which it is for both uh, welfare and growth uh, perspectives, for, for reasons of growth and welfare, but it's also becoming increasingly more feasible. Hi, Jenny Haver jones from the Lowy Institute. This is a question for Craig. Fiji seems to have been hit hardest by the global financial crisis, given they're fairly dependent on tourism and remittances. The government there has just announced a 50% cut to public service operating costs. Do you think this is an appropriate or sustainable response in Fiji's case, and will it help the overall situation? That's, um, that's the tricky one, because we don't actually know, to my understanding, we don't actually know how they're going to achieve that cut. And the risk always is that with these blanket cuts, that they're extremely crude tools, and they will simply find the, the, the part of the electorate that is uh, most insensitive to these these cuts. So there are some areas where they certainly can trim overseas missions, travel, um, excess domestic travel is, all, is also can probably be cut. But the trick is to preserve the critical <coughs> the priorities. And it's best if they're going to undertake some some sort of a blanket cut like that. They actually do nominate the priorities. And so I think we need to actually have a dialogue with, country, with governments now and see how they're actually going to go about these these uh, budget trimming exercises. Given that uh, corruption has been identified as a significant problem in some Pacific jurisdictions, uh, do you think if this was adequately addressed by governments um, at the moment that it would go some way towards offsetting the effects of the global financial crisis? Well, first of all, let me qualify what, what I just said a, a little while ago, that uh, oversaving or underconsumption is uh, is the key problem rather than underinvestment. I mean, our, yes, our empirical analysis fi does find oversaving or underconsumption to be a bigger source of Asian imbalances rather than underinvestment. But having and and to be more precise about investment levels, quantity on, of investment, we find that in most Asian countries including the countries that were hardest hit by the Asian crisis and where it is widely believed that there is underinvestment, in, in other words, investment is too low relative to the optimal level since the Asian crisis. Even in those countries such as Korea, Malaysia, Thailand and so forth, we do not find empirical evidence of underinvestment. Investment is quantitatively at more or less the appropriate levels. but. The, 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 but that does not mean that governments should sit back and do nothing about investment. To be more precise, they should do everything 
within their powers to improve and enhance the investment climate, which will enhance the quality of investment rather than focusing on uh, increasing the quantity of investment. So I think a very big key part of improving the uh, quality of in the improving the uh, investment climate rather is uh, by strengthening institutional framework, especially in countries where such as Indonesia and Philippines, where weak institutions, in particular weak government institutions, including relatively widespread uh, corrupt practices, are contributing to weak, poor investment climate that is contributing to uh, to discouraging productive, productive, uh, productive and efficient private sector investment activities. I think it, it's an interesting question in that it leads to another, another issue. Some people have said this is too good a crisis to miss. So, you know, it's going to give us some leverage so that we can bring in some change and corruption is an obvious area that we'd like change. But these sorts of deep problems, they, they, there are no quick solutions. And my concern is that if we, if we start focusing on these deeper problems, we actually miss, miss the problem. You know, we do nothing. We don't actually get anything on the ground. So we need to keep on making that, in, in our minds, keep balancing that, that trade-off between helping now and trying to fix these deeper issues. It's very useful, I think, for us to remember that this crisis is not just one where Australia has to worry about Australians. We actually have broader responsibilities uh, within our region, within the Pacific and also the Asian region. So uh, what's good for us is good for others and uh, we shouldn't be only focusing on ourselves because if we, don't, uh, if we don't provide the means elsewhere, it'll come back to bite us in the end. So I very much like the idea of crisis as opportunity. Can I ask you please now to join me in thanking our speakers from the Asia Development Bank, Dr. Rahman, Park and Sagden.